In the documentary, The Social Dilemma, we hear from former insiders at Google, Facebook, and Twitter. They confess that they're afraid of the technology they helped to create. Now we hear from the filmmaker, Jeff Orlowski. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Jeff Orlowski is best known for two captivating films about the climate crisis. In 2012, he made his debut with Chasing Ice that followed the photographer James Baylog as he documents melting glaciers with time-lapse cameras. For the first time, we could see with our own eyes the shocking erosion of that frozen landscape. Jeff's follow-up film is Chasing Coral, in which he used similar techniques to capture how coral reefs are being killed off by rising temperatures in the ocean. Both films perform a kind of magic trick. They make hidden phenomenon visible. His new film, The Social Dilemma, performs a similar reveal, only about technology. Fifteen years ago, in the early days of social media, Jeff was a student at Stanford University. One of his peers was Tristan Harris, who went on to work for Google. But in 2013, Tristan started to have grave misgivings about the way social media turned users into addicts. He explains in the film how he expressed those fears. And that was when I decided to make a presentation, kind of a call to arms. Every day I went home and I worked on it for a couple hours every single night. It basically just said, you know, never before in history have 50 designers, 20 to 35 year old white guys in California, made decisions that would have an impact on 2 billion people. 2 billion people will have thoughts that they didn't intend to have because a designer at Google said, this is how notifications work on that screen that you wake up to in the morning. And we have a moral responsibility as Google for solving this problem. And I sent this presentation to about 15, 20 of my closest colleagues at Google. I was very nervous about it. I mean, I wasn't sure how it was gonna land. When I went to work the next day, most of the laptops had the presentation open. Later that day, there was like 400 simultaneous viewers, and so it just kept growing and growing. I got emails from all around the company. I mean, people in every department saying, I totally agree. I see this affecting my kids. I see this affecting the people around me. We have to do something about this. I felt like I was sort of launching a revolution or something like that. Later, I found out Larry Page had been notified about this presentation in three separate meetings that day. And so it created this kind of cultural moment that Google needed to take seriously. And then, nothing. Tristan Harris is one of several Silicon Valley veterans who are interviewed in the film. Another is Tim Kendall, the former president of Pinterest, who has his own concerns about addiction. I was coming home, and I couldn't get off my phone once I got home, despite having two young kids who needed my love and attention. I was in the pantry, you know, typing away on an email or sometimes looking at Pinterest. I thought, God, this is classic irony. I am going to work during the day and building something that then I am falling prey to, and, and I couldn't, I mean, in some of those moments, I couldn't help myself. But addictive behavior is only the tip of the iceberg. The film explains how computer code for social media is designed to elevate extreme content because that's what gets the most clicks and sells the most ads. Ultimately, every user winds up in their own echo chamber, where the loudest opinions drive away journalistic fact-checking. One of the critics in the film is Jaron Lanier. He wrote the book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. What is he worried about? If we go down the current status quo for, let's say, another 20 years, we probably destroy our civilization through willful ignorance. We probably fail to meet the challenge of climate change. We probably degrade the world's democracies so that they fall into some sort of bizarre autocratic dysfunction. We probably ruin the global economy. Uh, we probably um, don't survive. You know, I, I really do view it as existential. 
you'll hear Jeff name several articles, books, and startups that add context to our conversation. We have links to those references in our show notes. I reached him this week at his home in Boulder, Colorado. We spoke by Zoom. I started by asking how he engaged with social media before this film. I mean, I think really it goes back to 2000 six or so when I had friends at Stanford who started working at the social media companies like very, very early on. I always loved these platforms. I helped friends get jobs at some of these platforms. Um, I had so many friends who were working in the space and um, I always saw the positive, shiny, optimistic worldview that that I think we all shared back then. Um, it wasn't until 2017 when I started hearing Tristan Harris speak about this, who's one of our main subjects, that I even questioned the positivity and the optimism coming from the platforms. Um, I certainly tried to use it for activist purposes. I certainly tried to, you know, as many people do and very many environmentalists, um, we, we think we can use these platforms to get a message out. And I, I see the value there and the thinking there, but um, the process of working on this film made me look at it from a completely different lens. And it's really upended my entire perspective of what these technology platforms are offering us. I mean, I was interested when I heard you were doing this film because I kind of thought of you as an environmentalist lifer uh, after having me, uh, <laughs> you know, chasing ice and chasing coral. And I've seen you give, uh, you know, a, a presentation before and you had really immersed yourself in that world and uh, yeah. in that subject. And, it, you know, in, in many ways, uh, it feels like it's the most important topic of our times to be engaged yeah. with the climate. Um, so I, I wonder what it took for you to, you know, switch from uh, all the work you've been doing around the climate crisis to yeah. this topic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyway, personally, I think for me, I've always just looked at what are the big issues that humanity is dealing with and what stories can I tell to help contribute to that? And I honestly, Tom, to take a, a step even further back, I never really planned on being a filmmaker. I, you know, I wanted to go on adventures and be a Nat Geo adventure photographer and to travel the world and to have fun and, and to, to see beautiful landscapes. And that's what gave me access to James Baylog, the photographer who became the subject of chasing ice, uh, my first feature. And, I, it was never a goal of, hey, I want to be a doc filmmaker or I even want to be a filmmaker. It was just like, what are these interesting ideas in the world? And and when when we had all this footage from Baylog's expeditions and it was clear, well, wait a second, we can make a movie out of this to make a difference. That's when things sort of flipped for me. And then that, that continued with Chasing Coral. Somebody reached out and said, hey, look at what's happening to the coral reefs. And we realized, well, wait a second, we can document this and tell the story because this is a huge, huge issue that people aren't aware of. Um, so for me, I've, I've sort of come into film as a tool to raise awareness about the big challenges and hopefully that the films can then contribute towards a conversation around solutions and a conversation around what do we need to do and how do we need to change. Um, so getting into film was kind of a, a you know, sideways entrance into um, wanting to make a difference and make a contribution. For me, climate and tech are the two, some of the biggest issues in my mind, I think the biggest issues of our time, these massive, massive existential threats um, that are reshaping the world around us. Um, some of our subjects reference our technology crisis as a climate change of culture that is invisibly changing the way we interact and relate with each other. It's invisibly changing the information that we have access to, um, who's choosing the menu from which we're seeing the world's information. And, and that's when I started learning about that, that's just when it became like a huge, huge light bulb for me, realizing that, you know, we can't solve issues like climate change if half the population doesn't think that it's real. We, we can't solve the big crises and the big issues that we're dealing with um, if people have been fed self-reinforcing views on these platforms, making it harder and harder to come together and to build bridges and to, to talk through a shared set of facts so that we can find solutions. Um, these platforms are putting us in our own filter bubbles, in our own Truman shows at a systemic, at scale fashion. And um, that, that's what really brought us into this, was realizing just how, how big of an issue this really is. So uh, Tristan Harris uh, in your film 
describes that these the creation of these tools came from around 50 designers who are now making decisions for 2 billion people. Yeah. Um, and in your film, you, you managed to interview uh, a few of the people that we might consider those uh, 50 designers. I, I mean, is this issue really as solvable as persuading the rest of those 50 uh, people <laughs> to uh, to have the same kind of ethical awakening that, um, that Tristan and, and others had? Yeah, great question. Um, in some ways, this is really, really easy. In other ways, this is really, really complicated. The easy part is that it's just code, right? This is just code that determines how Google operates, how Facebook operates, how Twitter operates, how Instagram operates. And just in comparison to climate change, like with climate change, we have this physical infrastructure that has been built that is really, really difficult to move away from. In the case of this technology, it's just code that can be rewritten. They send updates all the time. The challenge is that what we're discussing is a fundamental rewrite of the way the software operates. And it's one that arguably the stock market and their shareholders won't be thrilled about. And so the big challenge there is getting these systems to change in a way that um, that adheres to this capitalist system that they're stuck in. Um, and how do you change off a business model that is incredibly profitable, right? I mean, that's the big thing. They, they, we don't pay for any of this stuff. Like we're not paying for Twitter or for Facebook or for Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok. And yet they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Like the gap there, there's a huge, huge gap. And that gap exists in this um, behind the curtain business model, um, this Wizard of Oz style business model that we don't see and don't have access to and don't have transparency into um, that is one of manipulation. And that's one that is, is, is really manipulating us, the public. So how do we get these companies to change in a way that is really aligned for our incentives for the general public as opposed to for this the incentives of this micro-targeted surveillance driven business model so uh you have some interviews with people who have had a change of heart over um tools digital tools that they helped invent mm -hmm. there are other people who you name drop mm -hmm. in the film who you don't have a chance to interview you uh, Tristan Harris talks about Larry Page uh, at Google once reading uh, uh, his critique, and you have archival clips of Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Chamath uh, Palahapatia, uh, the mm -hmm. VP of Growth at at, at Facebook. Um, but you didn't have a chance to interview those people. I wonder, you know, what you see is the difference between the people who said yes to being interviewed and the people you might have liked to interview but uh, but didn't have access to i sort of feel like there there was this mindset that i certainly was in and i think many of my friends from stanford that worked in the tech industry were in around like the positive allure of these platforms um the kool-aid if you will and um i think it was right around 2017 2018 where i started asking friends who worked at these companies if they saw this critique that Tristan and others were offering, that there was this fundamental misalignment in the business model. Um, and I think it was really, really challenging for a lot of people to recognize that there was a problem, like a, a big phase of denial in some ways around owning up to the challenges of this thing that we built. You know, if I uh, founded a fossil fuel company a hundred years ago and discovered this thing that had great positive you know, affect on human civilization, we could travel and we can fly and look at all this, it'd be really, really hard to accept the reality of climate change, right? To think that your entire professional life has been contributing to harms. Um, and so I do think that there are a lot of people in the system that just still are having a hard time accepting a, a different perspective on their creations. Um, there are even people that we interviewed. So uh, Tim Kendall, Actually, the guy who built the, helped build the business model at Facebook, head of monetization at Facebook, became the president of Pinterest. Um, we did two interviews with him. The first interview, uh, he was talking about time and attention and trying to help people get off of their platforms, but he didn't really see the critique of the business model, to be honest. Like there were times during that conversation where I could hear him wrestling internally with some of the questions I was asking him. And could see him like sort of evolve actually over the course of that first interview where um, 
where he was challenging his own beliefs and talking them through. So we did that interview and, and time passed and several months later he reached out to us again on his own accord and he was like, you know what? My thoughts are very, very different now than they were when we did the first interview. And I see what Tristan has been saying. I understand the critique in a different way. I've been doing my own internal reflection. So we did a second interview with him. We actually green screened it so that we could put him back in the same location. So for the audience, you don't see two different interviews. Um, and so we had background plates and we were able to put him back in that same exact setting. And in his second interview is when he realized, yeah, this stuff, that's where his, his quote in the film about civil war came from where he realized what the end result of this is. Like if you continue this experiment and if you continue going down this path, we, he doesn't see a solution other, a, a, a place that we land other than civil war. So I think everybody that has been working on this stuff is going through their own evolution and thinking and reckoning stages of grief, denial, you know, just coming to terms with the, the Frankenstein that has been built. Um, and so I, I, I have a lot of empathy for these tech platforms, right? I, I would hate to be in Zuckerberg's shoes right now. I'd hate to be in Jack Dorsey's shoes. Like the responsibility and the burden is massive. They never expected these things to get as big as they did. Twitter started off as an art project, all right? And so now they've grown because of the success of their algorithms, because of their growth algorithms, because of their engagement algorithms. They've just gotten so huge and we're now seeing the consequences and they're dealing with these consequences in a way that I'm sure they never wanted this burden. Um, and so it's, I, I feel for them. It's a really tough situation to be in. Something I was wondering about the people who are interviewed in your film is uh, to, to what degree are these people still in the industry holding roles or how many of them are people who have cashed out and are now taking time yeah. to reflect? Yeah, um, I think it's different for every person. I know there are some people like Jeff Seibert, um, uh, who I know from Stanford very well, and who was one of the, he was a head of product at Twitter. Um, so high, high executive at Twitter. After he learned from Tristan and after he did his own thinking and reflections on this, he vowed to himself that he would not work at an ad supported company anymore. And so he's got a new company that he's starting um, called Digits right now. And it's a company that um, has a different business model. It's not designed for uh, this advertising incentive. And uh, Jeff Seibert wrote a, a great piece on Medium that kind of lays out his thinking in, in neat detail and nuance that we couldn't go into in the film around what are the consequences with this business model. Um, there are people like uh, Roger McNamee, one of the investors who have been actively doing a lot of press around this. Um, Tim Kendall um, has taken a, a big leadership role at a company called Moment, trying to help people get off of their devices and platforms. Justin Rosenstein has a thing called One Project that he's trying to develop and build. He has a company called Asana that he's been actively involved in, but he's trying to use One Project as a way to get humanity together, to synchronize together on how we solve and our, our big problems that humanity faces. Um, Tristan has his organization, the Center for Humane Technology, trying to reorient the ship around ethical design and ethical tech. Um, so each of them, just just you know, based on my knowledge of them and what they're trying to do, I think they are trying to use their time and their power and their money and their influence to make a positive difference. Um, I don't know if that's uh, you know trying to make amends for their past actions or just trying to chart a better path moving forward, um, but. I, I see many of them walking the talk in terms of their daily actions and their contributions, um, for sure. Um, you finished up your first version of this film in time for the Sundance Film Festival uh, in mm -hmm. January. You've since done more editing on it. But the big thing that happened after that is COVID-19 that yeah. uh, drove uh, you know many of us uh, even deeper into social media uh, as a way of staying connected to uh, family and friends. I wonder as you know and, and in some ways we may be feeling the more some of the more positive sides of social media mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, seven or eight months because it's you know it's the way we have um, you know, helped mitigate feelings of isolation. Right. I wonder, as that was happening, you know, if that was complicating for uh, your critique. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good question. Um, so 
let me just share some personal experiences that I think can tie into that. Um, I stopped using social media. I was a very, very heavy Facebook user. I think many of the people in the doc film community that I'm friends with on social have seen, I mean, during the last election, I was a heavy addicted many times a day user. Um, it was starting to work on this project that I started to see what was being fed to me and what I was seeing. I mean, I could feel amongst friends the 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 very odd breakdown between the Bernie and Hillary supporters during 2016 that became like vitriolic. And it was like, wait a second, aren't we on the same team? Like, isn't that like, and yet right. there are tensions forming everywhere. And this is sort of how I've been looking at social media now. Like it looks for any crack in society. And if it can push people in two different directions, it'll do that. Like that's more engaging than the center, right? The extremes are far more engaging. So for any aspect of any political issue, um, polarization is going to help drive an engagement algorithm more effectively. So even people that might otherwise normally agree are being split apart, from my perspective, through these platforms, um, Twitter in particular. Twitter and Facebook are where I think because of the short-form nature of them, it really decontextualizes things. Um, it really loses nuance. Like, there is no nuance on Twitter, right? So everything becomes more and more clickbaity style, aggressive tone that um, that just pushes people further and further away, in my opinion. Um, so I was starting to see that and feel that and reflect on that as we were starting to make the film and and as I was feeling the engagement from these platforms. So I removed myself from social media at the end of 2018 and basically stopped using it and just completely went cold turkey on all the social platforms. Um, when COVID happened, I felt no desire or need or interest to go back on personally. I didn't feel any pull to it. I was connecting to my friends and family through more phone calls and through more FaceTime calls and then through Zoom. Um, and these are things that we're paying for, right? We are not the product. We are paying for a, a, a Zoom account over 40 minutes. We're, when you buy an iPhone, you're paying for the FaceTime technology. You have text messages built in. So the ability for me to connect with my close family and friends wasn't lost in this time. Um, and so I've been engaging more than ever, but just not through these platforms that are mediated by other people and by other businesses. Um, I do see though, how a lot of people can find this sense of connection, um, through these social platforms. But one of our subjects argues it's not real connection. Um, it's connectivity, but it's not connection. When we see each other on a FaceTime call or on a, or on a Zoom call, we, we have mirror neurons in the back of our brain that are lighting up. I can read the 42 muscles in your face. I get more information through your head nodding right now. I'm, I'm hearing, I'm feeling that affirmation as I see you nod your head. And my brain is doing those calculations and creating this deeper bond between us. That's like a human to human connection is so powerful. All of that is lost when you have to, you know, distill things down to 280 characters on Twitter, like the context is lost, the nuance is lost. Somebody can post something that they think is sarcastic and is so clearly sarcastic, yet people read it and don't see the sarcasm and then reshare it with anger around like, how could this person have said this? And it can spiral out of control. And, and like the, that platform isn't really optimized for conveying the complexity of human engagement. So uh, back to your question. I mean, I, I don't feel like I've lost anything during COVID not being on these platforms. I get my news from news sources. I try to take out the, the middlemen, the algorithms that are trying to give me customized news. The concept of a customized, personalized news feed, like personalized news is so oxymoronic. Like that should not exist. Like We should not have personalized news like that. Um, because we've been moving further and further away from a shared truth, from, from shared facts. Um, you, you have a moment in the film where Mark Zuckerberg, I think in 2018, is being asked a question about uh, if he thinks Facebook changed the outcome of the 2016 election. And he's very uncomfortable uh, answering right. uh, that question. Uh, now here we are in 2020. Um you know, I wonder if you think any lessons have been learned since 2016, if anything uh, has changed, uh, and you know, what are the things that are uh, worrying you most about the dynamics of social yeah. media for this election? My goodness, I am, I am so frightened. Um, we have seen a bunch of reports come out in the last month uh, around many different aspects of how these systems are being used to manipulate the public, whether that is um, 
Russia changing their game this year and just hiring Americans to write stories <laughs> that look like organic content, right, that are being guided by an outside influence. Or if it's the um, whistleblower story from Sophia, uh, Sophie Zhang uh, in a BuzzFeed um, scoop about how she was in charge of looking at how different countries were manipulating their populations um, via these social platforms, in that case, Facebook in particular, um, and how the company either didn't do much or couldn't do much or just didn't get involved in these small, uh, relatively smaller countries like Honduras or elsewhere. Um, I think ultimately, no matter what Facebook tries to offer as a Band-Aid solution, even with their, their um, as of yesterday, their uh, banning of QAnon content on their platform, not only is it too little too late, but it's completely missing the fundamental problem of their business model. Like their, their business model and their structure is around, let anybody post anything. We'll pour, you know, lighter fluid on all the content so that the algorithms can try to push it up. And then only if something is really offensive, do we try to squash it with a, a, a team of content moderators. But the entire approach is built around this infinite scrolling newsfeed uh, engagement that is really optimized for their advertising business model. Like it, it, the entire system is driven around that business model and our time is their money. Um, I, I think the only way we're gonna really get to a meaningful solve is to move away from this business model that's misaligned with human society. Just like we know that burning fossil fuels is a problem for human civilization, this attention extraction advertising business model um, with user-generated content, like we, we now see that this has consequences on human society. That, that's the solve in my mind. I mean, it is at the level of a complete rewrite of the way these, these companies are thinking and are funded and are structured. You made a meaningful distinction a couple minutes ago about uh, technology that is driven by advertising. Going back to the old adage, if you're not paying for the product, you are right. the product. Uh, yeah. versus uh, technology like Zoom that we're talking through now uh, where we're we're paying for the product. Um, and uh, I, I want to ask you about Netflix, uh, which yeah. is the partner getting this um, film yeah. out into the world. That is a product uh, that we pay for, um, but it's a product that is also driven by algorithms and probably yes. yeah. you know plays a... Um, an outsized role in steering content into uh, people's uh, eyes these yeah, days. Totally. Um, uh, you know, I, I wonder how you've thought through um, the, uh, you know, contradictions, if there are contradictions certainly, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about that technology. Yeah. Um, Netflix and, you know, Hulu and Amazon and HBO and a bunch of other platforms are using algorithms for recommendations. Right, and so there's a there's an overlap there in terms of how the algorithms are are designed or functioned. Um, I think the big distinction for me is both around the user generated content versus curated content. All right, so there's a filter, there's like an editor basically, as you have with the news uh, entity. Right, so the New York Times or the Washington Post still have human curation that is overseeing the content that's going through the door and saying, okay, is this trustworthy? Is this reliable? Has this been fact-checked? So there's a human fingerprint there that's really, really meaningful in this case um, because I think it really dampens the ability for conspiracy theories and misinformation and false news to go viral. Where are, the, where are, you, where are we seeing misinformation going viral? We don't see that happening on HBO or Hulu or, or you know, Amazon Prime or Netflix. We see it happening on YouTube. We see it happening on Facebook. We see it happening on Twitter. And in the uh, uh, in the distinction between what are the greatest ills to society, I, I think that's for me where it's this business model that allows anything to go um, and is really incentivizing growth and scale and virality at all levels. That's what I was most concerned about in the making of the film. There is this bigger category, however, of what are algorithms doing to society, right? And so just for, to, to expand on this for a second, I mean, this is where we can be talking about some of these streaming platforms. But this is also where we can be talking about algorithms of oppression 
and racist data that exists in certain algorithms that is being propagated. So this is stuff that we don't go deep into in the film. It's just, it's, I mean, this could be a 10 part series, um, but I really want to shout out um, Shalini's uh, film, uh, Coded Bias. So Coded Bias is coming out very soon. And uh, Shalini has created a really powerful testament there around where are algorithms affecting humans, uh, not, not from the Facebook and Twitter style algorithms, but in um, police sentencing or, or judge sentencing algorithms, facial recognition algorithms, hiring algorithms. There are all these different places where um, algorithms are now affecting human lives. And if the data that those algorithms are based on reflects our historically racist society, those algorithms are only going to perpetuate the racism, the racism embedded in that data. Um, one of our subjects, Kathy O'Neill says, algorithms don't predict the future, they cause the future. And that was, it's just a huge, huge concept in my mind. Um, I would point people to um, Kathy's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, and to Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, uh, as really great resources on, on this part of the conversation. Um, but I think one of the big realizations was, you know, we've always looked at the tech industry as a handful of companies in Silicon Valley that are exporting technology to the world. And in the last several years, we've realized that's no longer the case. Now, every industry uses technology and every industry um, has the ability, the power to use algorithms that are opaque, that are privately owned, that have no transparency, that have no insights into the data. And they can really steer the way our country or our world is shaped. And, and nobody's the wiser. Like we can't, we can't get access to what's driving that code. I think that's a very, very scary path that we're going down um, when we don't know what are the motivations and incentives behind many of these companies. Uh, you've made a series of films now that um, have a message that w would like to change behavior in society, would like to uh, you know, uh, reduce carbon emissions uh, in the case of chasing ice and um, chasing coral, would like greater uh, attention paid and regulation um, to technology and, uh, and social dilemma. I wonder, you know, what you've learned about documentary storytelling and its role in trying to affect uh, change. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that question has to do with, you know, I, I think all three of these films are very powerful at identifying a problem Mm -hmm. And um, and I think documentaries in general often do a good job at identifying a problem and aren't really there to deliver the solutions uh, yeah. uh, necessarily. And this is this is it could be a frustration for a documentary viewer. Like you've just made me really angry about something. Right. Now what do I right. do? And right. you know I hear d documentary makers say, you know what? It's I I can't. I can't perform all the tasks. I can't tell right. you what to do. There are other people in this world, politicians, uh, specialists. It's their job to uh, figure it out. Right. But it's a frustrating experience as a viewer. It, uh, it certainly can be. Uh, and it's. I, I love your question around this because it's something that I spent quite a bit of time thinking through and, and talking about and debating with my team and with others. I actually do feel like nonfiction film is much better suited to identify problems, but it is not best suited in some cases to identify solutions in part because um, I, I think it really depends on the audience that you're looking for as well. Let me use Chasing Coral just as an example, because our hope there was to reach out to climate skeptics and to people who were still in the mid to, you know, 2010s um, still denying climate change. And, if the goal is to just get somebody to open their mind to the science that they might not otherwise have seen or been exposed to, once you start talking about solutions, it starts to feel like propaganda to some people in a different way. And so it's like, oh, you just did all of this just to, you know, grow government and to blah, blah, blah. And, and if, if you believe that the solution to climate change is legislation, if you say that in a film, it very quickly will, will rub certain audiences the wrong way. So I think um, in the case of Chasing Coral, this was something that we really actively talked about around how far do we want to go 
down this path of suggesting solutions if the goal really is to just increase people thinking about and talking about and being open to this message. So we took a stance there to really try to lean into the problem, identify that this is addressable, that there is a better path forward, but to not really explicitly lay out solutions in the film itself. This is something that I think we've seen with um, prior climate films even, where when they start listing some of the suggestions in the end credits and being pretty explicit about it, that's where I think there's been more resistance and pushback um, than in other parts of the of the filmmaking. So from my perspective, um, avoiding uh, explicit solutions can, in, in some cases, and in my experience often has, um, made it possible for more people to come to the table and to think about it and to engage in conversation rather than trying to rub people the wrong way with solutions that might be politically or otherwise um, uh, you know, something that somebody might disagree with. So that's been my philosophy on it. And I think that's where the impact campaigns and the conversations that follow the film can go deeper into more and more solutions that can hopefully bring in the people that have the power, the influence to make those um, ideas come to reality. And at the same time, in many cases, it's like the, the web of uh, complexity around solutions is so intricate that it's really hard to just offer a single silver bullet solution at the end of a movie and say, this is going to solve it. Like, you know, in 2020, if you made a climate film and said, change your light bulbs, like that's not going to work yet. There are still people in the public for whom change your light bulbs is a meaningful first step message, right? I think there's, there's this huge spectrum between the individual action, the um, community action, the corporate action, the government action, and each of those um, land in different areas. And in the public, some people are really aware of the problems and want really cutting edge solutions and ideas and other people are not, not there yet. So I, I think it's just really challenging to um, offer a catch-all solution frame that um, addresses where lots of different people are. Um, and I, I sort of, I think at least for me personally, when trying to tackle an issue like coral reefs that I knew nothing about going into that film or this critique around tech that I really had heard very little about going into this film, um, it's hard to make something that works really well for a general audience, um, that can carry all the way through where people are coming in at different levels of awareness of the issue. Um, so I don't know. I would love to talk through this more if you uh, if you got more thoughts on this. But it's 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 a really challenging place to land. I find um, as a filmmaker and and trying to tackle this concept of uh, incorporating solutions into a film or not. But I, I definitely recognize how for for many um, uh, very doc heavy um, audience members, if you've seen a gazillion docs on climate change, you're you just want the solutions, right? You're itching and you're hungry for just tell me what to do. Because that's where, like, you've you've gone through that experience. You know the issues at hand, and you want to know what can be done about it. Um, I think it's also just some of these are really hard because there there are no simple solutions. <laughs> right. Well, you know, another piece of it is that when we watch a film like Chasing Coral, that um, might feel like the most important thing to us for. 24 hours or so or maybe right. it stays with us for another week or or even uh, you, you know if we are still thinking about it a couple of years later the the motive to do something about it to stop eating meat or uh, change your transportation habits or right. uh, invest in solar energy uh, starts to wane from the feeling you had in that white hot moment and i'm sure there's a lot of people who will watch the social dilemma and for 24 hours think ah i should really get off uh facebook or get off twitter um and then uh, you know not do that um right uh so i wonder how you've you know reckoned with that um, you know, you must have witnessed this experience over and over again with your films where you, you see the white hot passion in the room and that right. cools right. off. Yeah, I think this is it's one of those things where for many people, it takes hearing an idea over and over and over before it sort of changes them internally. Um, I think in many ways, these films are just a, 
you know, a touch point in people's lives and experiences and uh, to help frame their thinking in a different way. Um, we had a bunch of people coming out of Sundance say, oh, wow, I saw the movie and I deleted my social media and then COVID happened and I was right back on. Right. But hopefully some of those people are now engaging with it in a different way, with a different consciousness, a different awareness. Um, are you using it intentionally for your purpose and your objectives? Are you, um, uh, are you trying to make it a tool that serves you? Uh, for me personally, like the endless scrolling, um, I just feel worse and worse when I go down that path. Um, another thing for me, when, when I was, uh, when I was trying to get myself off of Facebook, I was also learning about their resurrection algorithms. And this is something that we learned in the process of the film. Like if you're a heavy user and then you stop using, Facebook considers you dead to them and tries to resurrect you back to the platform. And so I started getting emails from like, oh, take a look at this thing Tom Powers posted. And oh, look at this thing. And so-and-so posted this. And, and they're basically just like fishing to get you to come back. And they don't, oh, so-and-so tagged you in a photo, right? They don't show you the photo, which they could easily do. They say you were tagged in the photo. So you click on the photo because you want to make sure it wasn't a bad photo of you. And you, you go back to the platform and maybe you, you scroll more through that. Um, the emails weren't working on me. And then they started sending me text messages and I started getting texts multiple times a day. And then it was like, here's a photo of a girl I had a crush on in high school that like, they know, like, I really want to click on that image right there. Um, and I started to really feel how manipulative these systems were and how they weren't really serving my interests. It wasn't like, you know, a way to deepen my friendship with fill in the blank person. It was just to get me to come back to the platform and it was really, in many ways, it was that experience and seeing that firsthand that made me just want to shut off to them. Like it, it, it wasn't, these aren't designed for me. Um, so it made it a lot easier for me to just emotionally let them go. Uh, here's my last question. Um, I'm going to upload this podcast uh, tomorrow. Um, I want as many people to listen to it uh, as I can reach. And the best tools I know to get people to uh, to be aware of things are Facebook uh, and Twitter, because that's where my audience uh, gets its right. information. Um, that's true of you know every Countless. documentary yeah. filmmaker that wants to reach right. uh, an audience. Um, how do you think through that conundrum? Um I've I actually have been thinking about starting my own personal email newsletter lately where it's like, OK, this is something that's not driven by some alternative business model, but is a way for me to reach people that have expressed interest in my work um, or friends of mine. And that's totally fine and legit. Right. I think we use these social media platforms in part because we all believe that everybody else is on them and that you have to take part because everybody else is there. But um, for me, I've always wondered, like, can can we just make content that's good enough that people want to talk about and want to share and want to spread? And how do we facilitate like help like having conversations around the content? Um, if somebody recommends a podcast episode to me, I'm almost certainly going to listen to it because they know me and it's like a personal recommendation. And I'm like that I I love getting recommendations like that. So there are lots of different ways we can engage with content. Um, I think part of the problem is that in large part, the way these systems are designed, we're just overwhelmed with content now. There's just like so much, con it's impossible to keep up with everything. So in this world where there's just like in a, a massive and exponentially growing quantity of content, it's it's hard to find out what's meaningful and relevant to you. Um, so I, I, I think we might actually go back to more and more human curation, right? That's what a film festival is. It's human curation and saying like, this is what we put our stamp on. We think these are beautiful, powerful films and they're worth your time and attention. I think that's why everybody's always been drawn to big festivals because they go and they know they're going to be like, they, they, they feel the trust in the curators and in the programmers. And they're saying, I'm going to put my trust in you with my time and attention and my money. And I want this powerful experience. I'm, I'm excited for more and more human curation around quality content and not have it be driven by an algorithm that's just optimized for maximizing our time. I want to thank Jeff Orlowski for speaking with me. His films, Chasing Coral 
and The Social Dilemma are both available on Netflix. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers, and on this episode, it doesn't really feel right to plug our social media. So let me just say, you can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.